Lieutenant Colonel Kettles was awarded our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This morning, he will be formally inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Ashton B. Carter, the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Eric K. Fanning, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Daniel B. Allen, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel A. Daly. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Matthew Smith and the invocation delivered by Chaplain Paul Hurley. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? Let us pray. Lord, God, source of strength to the faithful, source of hope to those who fulfill their oath to never leave the fallen behind, be with us now as we remember the heroic actions of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles, continued to bestow courage to our soldiers, families, and our nation. Strengthen our hearts today. And may Lieutenant Colonel Kettle's sacrificial example keep us mindful always of our sacred calling to serve our brothers and sisters, our army, our nation. Make his commitment to duty a part of our hearts and renew a calling, our calling to protect and defend the freedoms that you have given and the liberties that we enjoy. I pray all these in your most holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense. Deputy Secretary of Work, Vice Chairman Selva, General Allen, family and friends of Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. I particularly want to welcome his wife, Ann, son, Michael, daughter, Kathy, brother-in-law, Patrick, nephew, Michael. We're all so proud to have you here. We gather today here to honor an American hero. Though, like the three other Medal of Honor recipients who honor us with their presence today, he would resist that description. In fact, for nearly 50 years, he stayed quiet, content to allow his remarkable story to reside mainly in the memories of fellow soldiers like Roland Scheck and Dewey Smith, who are here with him today. Thanks, guys. 
And it would have stayed that way if his wife, Anne, hadn't prompted him to tell the story to William Volano, a dedicated volunteer with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, who is helping preserve and pass on these vital stories for the generations to follow. Even after some prompting, Lieutenant Colonel Kettles downplayed his role, talking up instead the heroism of his fellow soldiers and the technical capabilities of the H-1 Huey he flew in a new kind of war, and that, by the way, he still loves, and he just flew one a couple of weeks ago. Like so many of our veterans, he was content to know that he'd done his job, he'd served his country, and he'd looked out for his fellow soldier. But when this remarkable story was brought to my attention last August, I agreed that it was important to properly recognize his actions and asked Congress to pass special legislation allowing this belated honor. And thanks to the efforts of Representative Dingell, Senator Stabenow and Peters, and Chairman Rogers, President Obama was able to present our nation's highest military honor to Lieutenant Colonel Kettles yesterday in the White House. And today, it's our profound honor to add his name to the wall in the Hall of Heroes here in the Pentagon. But first, I want to talk about a different wall just over the river downtown, across the Potomac. There, there, as you all know, are over 58,000 names inscribed in black granite on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Every name represents a great loss for a family and our nation. But as President Obama noted yesterday, because of the valor of then Major Kettles and his crew on May 15, 1967, there are 44 names that are not on that wall. Just think about what that means. How many Thanksgiving tables have had an extra chair through the years because of his actions? How many weddings, childbirths, and graduations were made possible because Major Kettles and his crew returned again and again to the hot landing zone in the Sangjago Riverbed? We can only wonder, just as we can only wonder what must have gone through Major Kettles' mind the first time he approached the landing zone and saw an entrenched enemy in battalion force intensely firing upon an outnumbered American troops below. But we know that in the face of all that, he landed. And we know that he stayed under fire long enough to offload reinforcements and supplies and to take on the wounded. We may never fully comprehend what must have gone through Major Kettles' mind next as he piloted his damaged helicopter back to base full of holes, leaking fuel, but we know he made it, saving all on board. And then he jumped to another Huey. And we can only imagine then what must have gone through Major Kettle's mind as he returned to the landing zone, fully aware now of what he would face. But we know that he led six helicopters in, exposed to withering fire, to exfiltrate the embattled force. And then we can only guess what went through Major Kettle's mind as he made the defining decision to double back yet again, this time for the eight soldiers who remained pinned down on the ground and under continuous fire. Surely you must have known as the, uh, uh, that as the only aircraft landing, he would take all the fire. And he surely knew that without any air support, his odds of successfully taking off again weren't good. But we know that in the face of those odds, he did land. We know he retrieved the squad. And we know that despite being hit by a mortar round and machine gun fire, damaging his tail boom and his main rotor blade, shattering both the front windshields and the chin bubble, he still got into the air and back to safety once again. No, we can't fully know what went through the mind of Major J Charles Kettle that day. But we know what motivated him. We see it in the names on the walls of this very room. We can feel it in what has always motivated the men and women of our military, duty, honor, country. And the deeply held conviction that we will never, ever leave a soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine behind. For many American service members in harm's way, the first indication that they would see their family again was the sound of helicopter blades beating against the sky. Without the valor of the helicopter pilots in Vietnam, 
Countless additional names would have been added to the wall across the river. Without the pilots and crews who continue the watch, continue the watch today in Blackhawks and Ospreys and Chinooks and Lakotas and Payfox, Super Stallions, Cobras, Apaches, and more, over Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere, many more would have been lost over the past 15 years of war. Today, as we honor Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, we honor the many other pilots and crews who've taken great risks and make, made great sacrifices to support the warfighter on the ground and bring them safely home. If you were to walk from this auditorium up the stairs to my office, you'd see a large painting featuring a line from the book of Isaiah that well describes the man we honor today. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? The line goes, here I am, send me. Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, you've never hesitate, hesitated to answer, send me, when the call came. Whether it was serving active duty tours in Korea, Japan, and Thailand, or returning from civilian life as a citizen soldier to ser serve multiple tours in Vietnam, or displaying conspicuous gallantry in the face of enemy fire in the river, on the riverbed of Song Jago, on behalf of the families of the 44 men you helped save that day, on behalf of the men and women of this Department of Defense, and on behalf of a deeply grateful nation, I congratulate you on this well-deserved honor, and I thank you for your service to the United States of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the Army. Good morning, Secretary Carter, General Allen, senior leaders of the department, civilian and military, Medal of Honor recipients, and especially Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, his family and friends, it's an honor to be with you. Our admiration for Lieutenant Colonel Kettles comes from his acts of heroism, but also from his quiet professionalism. From how on the day of his greatest testing, just as with all other days, he embodied the Army's values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. But I need to be honest up front. Behind my appreciation for Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, there's also some home state pride. He's a fellow Michigander. So when I heard that Lieutenant Colonel Kettles and his family drove themselves here to Washington and in a vehicle that he custom designed for his beloved wife, Ann, and when I heard later that he asked the Secret Service if he could wheel right up to the White House for yesterday's ceremony, I thought to myself, that's pure Michigan. <laughs> and we've seen this Midwestern And we've seen this Midwestern manner of humility and humor throughout this process, starting when we first reached out to him. When we asked how he'd like to be addressed, he said, you can call me anything you'd like, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> Eight of Chuck and Ann's ten children are here today, and I want to thank them for being with us and for not laughing or laughing at the lines you've probably heard a hundred times. If you grow up in Michigan, chances are you've spent some time with machines. For Chuck Kettles, that meant a love affair with engines and aviation from the very start of his life. From his education at Edison Institute in Dearborn, where he practiced on a flight simulator, to his work with cars and engines at his Ford dealership, we see some of what prepared him to be an Army aviator. The Huey that Chuck flew was pioneering, a pioneering machine at the time, but he knew instinctively how to get the most out of it. So while the deeds we honor today were the product of great courage and valor, they had the roots in what he learned growing up in Michigan. Chuck was highly skilled and well prepared to fly into danger, but what he achieved on May 15, 1967, was not predestined. His heroic actions were the result of individual, individual decisions he made on that day and every day he served as an Army officer, from the very day he volunteered to serve in Vietnam. 
Ultimately, it was because Chuck decided, not once, not two or three times, but on four separate occasions to fly directly into enemy fire that 44 American lives survived. Each time, he knew it would be more dangerous, yet each time, he made the same decision. Chuck had never met most of the soldiers he was rescuing. He had no idea about their backgrounds, their race, who they loved, or where they went to pray. All he knew was that they were his fellow soldiers, that they were fellow Americans. At the back of his mind, he must also have understood that for these young men to see their parents again, to embrace their loved ones again, to serve their country again, it all depended upon him and his crew and the decisions he would make that day. A couple of months ago, Chuck went out to dinner when a man approached him. He pointed to a table where his children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, 14 people in all had gathered. And he said to Chuck, you see those folks over there? It's all your fault. <laughs> it was an extended family of one of the dozens of men Chuck and his crew had rescued. Over the past two days, the President, the Department of Defense, and the Army have celebrated Chuck's heroic actions. But we still have no way to appreciate them in their totality. Because we have no way to calculate the contributions of those Chuck rescued, of the families they raised, or all of the people they inspired. We do know, however, that many of the soldiers Chuck served alongside endured a painful homecoming. For some, their service was little regarded. For others, they were shunned by friends and loved ones because of it. Their experience should weigh on all of us, and it must never be repeated. In the United States, we pride ourselves on the free exchange of ideas, and robust debate about our nation's security is essential. But we must not conflate our views of war with our views of our warfighters. As President Obama has said, we must show all who have worn the uniform the respect and dignity they deserve. In learning about his heroic, this heroic soldier from Ypsilanti, we've seen patience, humility, and duty redefined. In hearing the stories of many of his brothers, members of the team to which he was so devoted, we've seen what we value most as an army. For his part, Chuck decide, describes his deeds humbly. He volunteered for Vietnam, he has said, because there was a need and I had the skills. He felt a duty to contribute because it was the right thing to do. Long after he left Vietnam, he's carried those commitments forward. The technical skills that helped save so many lives in Vietnam, he shared with generations of students in Michigan. To this day, he visits local high schools to answer questions about a war those students never knew. Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Kettles was the consummate Army officer, but across his life, he's also served as the best kind of teacher, one who instructs through his actions, through his patience, and his humble example. Yesterday and today, we've had the chance to bestow a long overdue honor, but we've also had the opportunity to recall some overdue lessons as a country. We've had the chance to put the courage and valor of Chuck Kettles at the center of how we understand our history, our country, and the citizens who serve it so proudly. For that and so much more, Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, you have our deepest admiration as an army. You have our deepest appreciation as a nation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Secretary Carter, Secretary Fanning, SMA Daily, DefSec Def Work. It's uh, an honor to have all of us here to share this incredible day with the Kettles family. And I thank the extended audience for joining us to recognize our American hero. Today, as we induct Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles into the Hall of Heroes, we are inspired by the impact of courageous leadership and the attributes exemplified by Charles Kettles that make our Army and our military the greatest fighting force the world has ever known. My comments, hopefully complementing those you have already heard, focus on Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, the soldier, 
the leader of character, a man who, through his actions nearly 50 years ago, provides timeless inspiration for warriors today. General George Patton, succinctly describing a surprising but fundamental linkage, stated that courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Charles Kettles exemplified this assessment. Facing a determined enemy not once, twice, or three times, but on four separate occasions on 15 May 1967. Each time as the situation became more and more precarious, he controlled his incalculable fear and led with grit and determination to accomplish the mission. He personified courage, commitment, and character. And he set an example that we pray few others will ever have to emulate. Charles Kettles, the citizen soldier, started his Army career from humble beginnings. A native of Ypsilanti, Michigan, he was born with aviation in his blood. His father was a pilot in both World War I and World War II. Drafted during the Korean conflict, Charles earned his commission and later attended flight school, but then returned to civilian life, ready to answer a future call to service. In 1963, with the United States becoming embroiled in Vietnam, that call came. The Army needed pilots, so Charles volunteered to fly UH-1 Deltas, popularly known as Hueys. In 1967, near the height of the United States commitment, Lieutenant Colonel then Major Kettles deployed to Vietnam. These were difficult days for United States forces. The enemy was elusive, the jungle was unforgiving, and soldiers did not enjoy nearly the level of support from the American people that we take for granted today. Colonel Kettles began, began 15 May like so many others, leading a platoon of eight 176 assault helicopter company Hueys on a ground insertion. In this case, with 160 troopers of the 1st Battalion, 327th Infantry so that they could find, fix, and destroy enemy forces west of Duck Fo. Once on the ground, these men found themselves in the fight of their lives against a force estimated at battalion strength of North Vietnamese Army. The horror of the fighting that day, most accounts describe the intensity of fire as unbelievable, is essential to understand and fully appreciate the magnitude of Charles Gallantry. The NVA, using a combination of automatic weapons, machine guns, mortars, and recoilless rifles, hammered the Bastogne soldiers from fortified positions dug into the hillside, pinning them down and causing numerous casualties. In the face of this grim situation, the soldiers' only hope was rapid reinforcement from their aviation brothers. The mission to lead reinforcements into the engagement area and evacuate the wounded fell to Charles Kettle and his outfit, who, when notified, did not hesitate. He did not flinch. He provided decisive leadership, beginning with the insertion of the first wave of reinforcements in the midst of heavy suppressive fire, because he knew that any delay on his part would imperil those fighting for their lives on the ground. As the helicopters approached, the enemy opened up with an intensity of fire surpassing any experienced before. Soldiers were being hit and killed before they could leave the birds. Lieutenant Colonel Kettles, whose own aircraft was hit nearly 30 times, held his fear in check in that hellhole on earth to, to deliver two lifts of reinforcements evacuate the wounded, and despite incurring casualties, including one to his own gunner, he overcame seemingly inhuman odds to accomplish the mission. Later in the day, when the ground force commander requested exfiltration of the remaining 44 troopers, Charles Kettles again, again selfishly volunteered and put himself into harm's way for a third time, despite having only one flyable UH-1 Delta left in his unit. Though he knew full well the consequences, 
He also knew more intensely the urgency of immediate action and his own unique qualification to lead this extraction. Charles Kettles, with five aircraft from a sister unit, landed amid a hornet's nest of heavy NVA small arms and mortar fire. Once the troops were loaded, the pilots departed, but were soon notified that eight troopers were left on the landing zone. Charles did not hesitate. He immediately broke off, passed flight lead to another aircraft, and returned for a fourth landing into that LZ to bring everyone home. Dewey Smith, one of those remaining on the ground, described the situation, and I quote, we all figured we were done for when at the end of the valley, we saw one lone helicopter headed our way, end of quote. Kettles once again vanquished his fears, bouncing several hundred feet into that LZ, and he loaded the remaining soldiers as mortars pounded and tracers flashed all around. The enemy concentrated all their firepower on Kettles Huey. Smoke billowed inside, the aircraft lurched from left to right, but somehow, some way, he was able to fly it, coax it, will it out of that landing zone. Lieutenant Colonel Kettles demonstrated his commitment and deep-seated loyalty to all those men and our entire nation by his actions that day. He did not quit. He refused to leave any soldier behind. And as you have heard, because of him, 44 names were spared from the possible etching on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall here in Washington, D.C. Never one to take credit, Charles Kettles remains the humble man from Michigan. In his words, he didn't do it by himself. There were 74 pilots and crew members involved. And as he insists, this honor belongs to them today as well. We pay tribute today to Charles Kettles for his inspiring valor. And in doing so, we also honor those 74. Men like his co-pilot, Chief Warrant Officer Ray Sechrist, his gunner, Specialist Roland Scheck, and so many others, some of whom are present here today. But perhaps more importantly, we also pay homage and honor to those soldiers who did not make it home who, like American soldiers for the past 241 years, have valiantly defended our nation against incalculable odds and made the ultimate sacrifice. Let this Medal of Honor be a source of strength to all of our service members who continue the work of defending this great nation so that we might be a light of freedom to the world today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you, Charles Kettles. God bless you and Army Strong. Secretary Carter, Secretary Fanning, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, and Lieutenant Colonel Kettles will now join General Allen on stage for the induction ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Major Charles S. Kettles, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Major Charles S. Kettles distinguished himself by conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity while serving as Flight Commander, 176th Aviation Company, Air Mobile, Light, 14th Combat Aviation Battalion, Americal Division, near Duc Phu, Republic of Vietnam. On 15 May 1967, Major Kettles, upon learning that an airborne infantry unit had suffered casualties during an intense firefight with the enemy, immediately volunteered to lead a flight of six UH-1 Delta helicopters to carry reinforcements to the embattled force and to evacuate wounded personnel. 
Enemy small arms, automatic weapons, and mortar fire raked the landing zone, inflicting heavy damage to the helicopters. However, Major Kettles refused to depart until all helicopters were loaded to capacity. He then returned to the battlefield with full knowledge of the intense enemy fire awaiting his arrival to bring more reinforcements. Landing in the midst of enemy mortar and automatic weapons fire that seriously wounded his gunner and severely damaged his aircraft. Upon departing, Major Kettles was advised by another helicopter crew that he had fuel streaming out of his aircraft. Despite the risk posed by the leaking fuel, he nursed the damaged aircraft back to base. Later that day, the infantry battalion commander requested immediate emergency extraction of the remaining 40 troops, including four members of Major Kettle's unit who were stranded when their helicopter was destroyed by enemy fire. With only one flyable UH-1 helicopter remaining, Major Kettle's volunteered to return to the deadly landing zone for a third time, leading a flight of six evacuation helicopters, five of which were from the 161st Aviation Company. During the extraction, Major Kettles was informed by the last helicopter that all personnel were on board and departed the landing zone accordingly. Army gunships supporting the evacuation also departed the area. Once airborne, Major Kettles was advised that eight troops had been unable to reach the evacuation helicopters due to the intense enemy fire. With complete disregard for his own safety, Major Kettles passed the lead to another helicopter and returned to the landing zone to rescue the remaining troops. Without gunship, artillery, or tactical aircraft support, the enemy concentrated all firepower on his lone aircraft, which was immediately damaged by a mortar round that shattered both front windshields and the chin bubble, and was further raked by small arms and machine gun fire. Despite the intense enemy fire, Major Kettles maintained control of the aircraft and situation, allowing time for the remaining eight soldiers to board the aircraft. In spite of the severe damage to his helicopter, Major Kettles once more skillfully guided his heavily damaged aircraft to safety. Without his courageous actions and superior flying skills, the last group of soldiers and his crew would never have made it off the battlefield. Major Kettles' selfless acts of repeated valor and determination are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Army. The Medal of Honor plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Lieutenant Colonel Kettles into the Hall of Heroes. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented to Lieutenant Colonel Kettles. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action, above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Thank you, Secretary Carter, Secretary Fanning, General Allen, and Sergeant Major of the Army Daily. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Charles S. Kettles. Good morning.
Let's try that one more time. Good morning. morning. We're making progress. It is a good morning. We're all above ground, each of us with another opportunity to excel and uh, in a position to be very grateful for this nation. Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Ash Carter. Secretary of the Army, Mr. Eric Fanny, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Allen, representative of all those who do it daily, Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel Daly, members of Congress, Medal of Honor recipients here, distinguished guests, all families, for that is the core of this nation. And friends, and I include in that category everyone, for as it has been said, a, a, uh, A stranger is only a friend I have not met. Thank you for the invitation to join with you here today. I take this opportunity to focus on those who have served this nation and that mission on 15 May of 67. for which the Medal of Honor was awarded yesterday. It is fitting that we acknowledge and share the honor with the 74 helicopter crew members who were involved in the total mission on that date. It belongs to them. With their deep regard for their fellow soldiers, minimize the losses on that date. However, I first take this opportunity to acknowledge and extend my appreciation for the many who have been involved in bringing this Medal of Honor to the forefront. Some of whom are Bill Volano, who's been mentioned before, who back in January of 2012 initiated action to upgrade the, the Distinguished Service Cross to the Medal of Honor through then Representative John Dingell's office. Representatives John Dingell and Debbie Dingell, Michigan's 12th district, and they were the congressional sponsors. Debbie ran the halls of Congress to get the necessary waiver which was required for the five year restriction. Sharon Vesprima with the Dearborn office of Debbie Dingell, who spent endless hours ensuring that this action was completed. My friend of some 54 years, <clears throat> Major General Marvin Back, retired. General Back, back in the 50s, late 50s, was my detail sergeant in a reserve unit in Lansing, Michigan. <clears throat> he, uh, he is here with us today. And those comrades here today who were directly involved in that action some 49 years ago. And to my son, Mike, who with the aid of the internet was able to find many of those who were directly involved that day and reconstruct the mission as executed. Thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for this honor to join those many who have gone before me 
in the Hall of Heroes, two of whom <clears throat> were are Master Sergeant Roy Benavides and Major Bill Adams. I knew them both. On 15 May 1967, some of this you have heard already, uh, the, big, the mission began about 0930 hours. During four lifts, some 160 troops were inserted into that LZ. It lasted well into the evening hours, at which time the battalion commander requested emergency extraction of what remained, was, which was 44 men. That was successful. But what will remain of utmost importance above all else is those names do not appear on the wall down the street. Each crew member of those helicopters did their duty and then some. Together that day, the values and bond that each soldier understands. We will not leave any soldier behind. The award can only be worn by one person. However, it represents the collective heroism and sacrifice of all those men who were involved in that operation on that day in the Song Tre Khao Valley. There were two other men who were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for that action that day. Leon Wessel, a forward observer, field artillery. Lonnie Butts, a Tiger Force medic. Unfortunately, Lonnie Butts lost his life in the service to our country and his fellow soldiers that day. Today we have a few of those who served directly that day in the battle. They, however, represent the entire group of soldiers. Don Long and Ron Roy, who between lifts in the, into that LZ, brought ammunition in for resupply. One such trip, they took a mortar round on the mast of the helicopter. Bad scene. They exited that aircraft in great haste. Don Long received a small arms round in his ankle. All four joined the infantry. Don Long back to his basic branch with only a 38 revolver at his side. Not much competition for a battalion size of North Vietnamese. Matt McGuire was the gunship lead. In spite of the damage to each of his helicopters, Matt was always there with team. He, <clears throat> at the end of the day, there were not, we had nine helicopter gunships in that platoon, but only one was flyable. Larry McQuaid and many other pilots continued to fly aircraft which probably should have been grounded. But it was they re <clears throat> remained committed to the welfare of our troops trapped in that battle. John Osborne, he was crew chief on 052, the last helicopter we had that was flyable in the 176th for the extraction of the remaining 44 men. During that mission, he took a round, or a, uh, a shrapnel round in the knee. Subsequently, he refused to accept a Purple Heart. He regarded 
says nothing. Ray Sechrist. Unfortunately, Ray is unable to be with us here today. Um, medical reasons, he's unable. I have communicated with him in recent times, but he felt he was not capable. And my son went to see him to see if there was any possibility and decided that Ray was right. Ray was my co-pilot and had been for some time at the beginning of the formation of the 176th. He was the only crew member who went in and out of that LZ all six times. Ray was a superb pilot. He was a flight standardization instructor pilot for the unit. His courage and determination was unwavering throughout that mission. He had volunteered to go back out there with me after we'd already gone through one helicopter in <clears throat> against what flight operations had assembled with uh, one of the pilots who normally flew that aircraft, Ray insisted that he go instead, which of course, as many of you would realize, was a great asset. I didn't have to brief him on anything because he knew the situation as well as I did. Roland Scheck was over here. He was my door gunner, had been from day one at Fort Benning, Georgia. When he, <clears throat> Roland is a rather unique person in, in that he was a German national, gone to Canada, joined the militia in Canada with the expectation of going to Vietnam. Learning that they were not going to Vietnam, he came across the border at Detroit and joined the United States Army. I had the good fortune of having him for my gunner. On that day, he took a round in the left knee, which destroyed not only his knee, but the uppermost part of his left leg. The following day, I went down to Quinion Hospital to see Roland. Roland was in the hospital bed with sheet and blanket, looked pretty normal. Rather casual discussion initially. And then Roland, also very casually, said they took my leg off last night. I was uh, uh, short on words. Uh, he went on to say, that's all right. I'll be fine. He is over here today. Roland spent a year at Walter Reed, discharged, married. He and Miriam raised three youngsters. One of them is a Coast Guard officer today. One is an Army officer. A third is in our federal system here in D.C. That's Roland. Richard Ammons and Dewey Smith, two of the last eight that were extracted out of that LZ. Richard Ammons uh, was unable to be here today. We do have Dewey Smith here in front. They were, as I mentioned, the last among the last eight. They had been putting up a last ditch effort to defend the troops as they loaded on board the six helicopters. Their allegiance to the welfare of the other men that day is to me what makes our country what it is for all of us today. 
three months ago, and you heard some of this story earlier, three months ago I had the opportunity to fly the Huey one more time. Sheck and Dewey Smith were there also to fly in the helicopter again. That evening we had a dinner in Finley, gathered with our families, gathered around uh, a restaurant there, and near the conclusion of the dinner, Dewey stood up, pointed to all 14 plus family and, uh, seated at the table, and said, it's all your fault. I <clears throat> immediately denied any responsibility <laughs> for what Dewey may have done after I got him back to a secure area. <clears throat> I have a deep sense of gratitude for the opportunities that each person is afforded by this nation. I also believe that there is no price too great for anyone to pay that contributes to the preservation of our great nation. I have faith in each generation that has come along and will in the future. <clears throat> All the details of this mission on the table, saving the 44 men, is the only thing that matters. May God continue to bless this great nation, those who have been gone before us in battle, those in harm's way today, and those future generations who may very well have to serve as we have. Thank you, please. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Kettles. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and join in singing the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing a song with the Army of the Free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won. And the army goes rolling along. Then it's high, high, hey. The army's on its way, count off the cadence loud and strong. For wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. 